Dr. Durson comes to us as our latest uh, EMS faculty member at the University of Colorado. I'm going to let him introduce himself, but just want to throw out that he um, is someone who I've worked with over the last many years when he was a, a baby doctor as a resident and then as a fellow, and we are thrilled to have him as part of our EMS team and our EMS education team at the University of Colorado. So a uh, huge, huge uh, ex amount of excitement from our team that we have Dr. Gerson with us now. Um, he's a lifer in the field, so lots of pre-hospital experience before he went to medical school. I'll let him give you his stories and please jump in, participate. We're really excited to have you guys here. And Dr. Durson, I'll let you take it from here. Perfect. Um, thank you, Dr. Wright. So I am Mike Durson. I am, as Dr. Wright said, one of the EMS physicians at University of Colorado. Uh, I actually am originally from California. Please don't boo me off the screen for that. Um, but I worked in San Luis Obispo County as a paramedic and I spent 10 years in the field, uh, before I got this crazy idea to go to medical school and become an EMS physician, all with the goal of trying to make EMS a little bit better. Where I worked, we had everything from a college town, kind of think Fort Collins, um, all the way out to our rural areas where we had three hour response times and transports and required dedicated four wheel drive vehicles. So a little familiar with some rural environments, not necessarily exactly the same as yours, but um, the beautiful thing is, is that everybody needs to breathe and respiratory is kind of a common thing for everyone. So uh, this is called breathe in, breathe out, and sometimes you don't, um, just kind of a little fun thing. So with all of this, we have some objectives for tonight. So we're gonna kind of go over respiratory uh, system anatomy and physiology. We're going to discuss some differences between ventilation and respiration and kind of demystify that a little bit. Sorry, I'm having a little PowerPoint issue here. We're going to go over some respiratory uh, pathology because everybody likes to learn about diseases. Uh, and we're going to talk really about the pre-hospital management of different respiratory emergencies. And we'll kind of do this uh, stepwise as we go through. Um, and in the end, we're going to apply some knowledge with some fun cases. Hopefully they're simple, they're straightforward, but they kind of hit home on the learning points. Um, real quick, sorry about this. I am having some major PowerPoint issues. Uh, I have no disclosures, financial interests, conflict of interests. And a couple of things I always like to start off with here. First of all, this is a general medical training for pre-hospital providers. All right, I am going to give you overview knowledge that you need to know to be an effective pre-hospital provider. And knowing that we have a lot of different levels of providers out there and every EMS system is different because every patient population is different and our EMS system should be designed to meet the needs of the communities that they serve. Um, we're gonna do a little bit of an overview and we're gonna try and do some of this at the very basic uh, EMR level where you are those first responders on there doing those immediate things to kind of help people out. And you're the, maybe the first one that shows up by yourself all the way up through our advanced providers, our paramedics, that may even be going into the critical care transport, doing interfacility transports, taking the sickest of the sick patients to where they need to be. Um, everything that I talk about here does not supersede your protocols or expand your scope of practice. I am gonna talk about things that if you were a EMR or EMT basic, you are not gonna be able to do. Um, but we're gonna talk about it because I think it's really important to understand everything that the advanced providers are gonna do and understand that the impact that you have as that first on scene on all those down the line interventions. And, and when you're out there and it's just you and your partner and your par partner happens to be a paramedic, you have to be able to help them and understand everything going on. Um, if I have anything that I show devices, equipment, medications, I'm not endorsing any of them. It's just simply to illustrate. So please don't think that I'm endorsing anything. And above all, my medical director used to have a letter in the front of our protocol book back when there were actual printed protocol books. And it talked about the protocols that developed, how they were developed. But in the end, there was always a line on the end that these protocols are not a substitute for good clinical judgment. And I think that's something we always need to remember is I'm going to teach you certain things you're going to learn. But if it doesn't make sense, if it doesn't match your patient, don't try and force what I tell you onto your patient and apply it to your patient. Do what is best for your patient. And that's what makes a great free hospital provider. All right, let's get into the meat of it. So we're going to talk first about kind of the anatomy and physiology of breathing. So what does the respiratory system do? Well, it does a lot of different functions. First of all, breathing in general brings air in and out of the body. And I say air very specifically because 
air is made up of lots of different things, nitrogen and oxygen and carbon dioxide and whatever else happens to be out there. Um, but it also does gas exchange specifically, where it brings oxygen in in a higher concentration than in your body, and it moves carbon dioxide out from where it's in a high concentration coming out of your blood into your lungs and brings it out into the environment. Um, it serves as an immune barrier. So you have mucus and other things that trap particulates. So if you're you know, fighting a wildland fire and you get that smoke and ash in your mouth, it's going to get trapped in the um, mucus. And then you have little cilia, little like finger things that help move it out. So it's really helping protect your immune system or function as part of your immune system. It helps with sound production. Obviously, I have to breathe in to be able to make these sounds and talk for the next hour and a half. Um, it assists in smell. You need to be able to move air over your olfactory bulbs and the nerve endings in order to smell things. It moisturizes and humidifies the air. I know we all live somewhere in the plains or in Denver or somewhere around, and that air is a little bit drier than some other places. Um, but that moisture kind of helps protect everything. And then it actually helps maintain our acid base status in our body. Um, and it does that by getting rid of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is an acid um when it's in our bloodstream and so it helps get rid of that and that's why you'll see patients like who are in diabetic ketoacidosis breathing real fast with those kuzmal respirations and those fast deep breaths that are trying to get rid of that carbon dioxide and kind of fix their ph because they're acidotic from uh their dk so just part of the function not that you need to know dk so how does breathing work and i think this is really key to understanding uh the disease processes so you basically, your lungs work on a vacuum system. So you stimulate your diaphragm, you stimulate your intercostal muscles, primarily the diaphragm though, and those move, the diaphragm moves down. That creates a bigger chamber with a fixed amount of stuff, which basically lowers the pressure, creates a vacuum. And so you see this idea that you have this interpleural pressure here that while you don't need to know the numbers, this is atmospheric pressure on the outside, but you see that it becomes negative. And yet the pressure inside the lungs is actually at zero because it's equal with that of the atmosphere um, for this example. So you have this zero pressure in the lungs and this negative pressure around it, and that causes the lungs to expand. Um, and so that's a really key function of understanding with respirations. You have this fixed system connected to the outside world where you have what we'll call one atmospheric pressure because it's just an easy measurement and you have this negative around here. And so that negative force that you create actually expands the lungs and forms a vacuum that sucks in the air. And then when you relax your diaphragm and it moves back up, it creates a positive pressure that forces that air back out. And this is really key to think about when we compare it to when we put a breathing tube in someone, intubate them and, and breathe for them or we put a, a bag valve mask over them and breathe for them, we change that system from a negative pressure system to a positive pressure system. Um, because for some reason that's not working. And so I think it's just really key to understand that you need this sealed vacuum to breathe. And that might come up later on as we talk about some diseases. Really, we wanna talk about oxygenation to start. And there's three main steps. The first of these is ventilation. Um, and ventilation is that movement of air, that creating of the vacuum brings air into the lungs um, and then pushes air back out when it relaxes. Um, the next step in this is diffusion. And so diffusion, remember, is where you take something in a real high concentration and you move it to an area of less concentration, okay? Um, so you're at that big work event that you really don't wanna hang out with everyone. There's some nice open air outside. You move outside where there's less people. That's diffusion. Um, same idea with air movement. So if you have a high concentration of oxygen in the lungs, low concentration in the bloodstream, it diffuses across the barrier. Um, here, the kind of alveolar capillary interface into the bloodstream. And the same thing with CO2. CO2 is in a high concentration in that bloodstream. It moves across to the low concentration of the air that you just inhaled because it's much lower. It's fresh air from the outside and it moves back and forth. And then that oxygen has to be delivered to the tissues and that carbon dioxide has to be picked up and brought back to the lungs. And that's perfusion. So you have ventilation, diffusion, and perfusion. And all of those are gonna be key into our disease processes that we talk about here in the future in a, in a few minutes to see kind of how that works. There's also the idea of respiration. And so we all think of like, oh, put them on a respirator. 
Well, actually respiration has to do with the metabolic function and not to scare everyone, but there is chemistry involved, but we're not gonna do that today. And it's a different lecture for a different time. But the idea being that what I want to illustrate here is that there are two types of respiration that we undergo. There's aerobic, which involves oxygen and anaerobic, which does not. Um, aerobic respiration, as you can see here, creates a lot of energy. Just take my word for it. ATP is your energy unit and you make a lot of it. With the same amount of glucose or sugar, if you don't have oxygen, you don't make as much energy. And so that that is why it is so key for us to make sure that we minimize, you know, we fight respiratory disease, we, we keep ourselves healthy so that we can get that oxygen there so that we have a more efficient machine to run. I know that, you know, some of us may be uh, looking forward to after the lecture where we can look at some of the products of our anaerobic respiration. Again, another lecture for another time. So how does breathing really work? How does it get uh, triggered? And so the first thing to understand is what drives breathing for the most part. And what actually drives it is the pH of our blood. So every time that that carbon dioxide builds up in our blood, even by a minuscule amount, it makes our blood a little more acidic. And when it becomes a little more acidic, that blood actually can transfer some of that acid across the blood brain barrier into the cerebral spinal fluid and um, in the areas around it. And there's little receptors that measure the acid levels. And when it, that acid level goes up, it triggers us to breathe because it understands that our body works to reduce the acid by breathing out that carbon dioxide. And so that's a big thing that drives our breathing. And when we look at it, breathing is all controlled by our brainstem. So it's this primitive brain function. So if this is the part that we think with and that we move with and that we see with, this lower part is part of our kind of our primordial brain that does our basic functions. Um, and that controls our breathing. And so we have things like the pneumotaxic center, which controls uh, inhalation and exhalation based on stretch receptors. How much do we breathe in and stops us? Uh, we have the apneusic center, which is really what tells us our body to take a deep breath. And then we have these inspiratory and expiratory centers that control it. All of these are, it's important to know that those are parts of the brain that control our breathing and all of those different stimuli put it in there. And then we look at how much air we breathe. Well, this is kind of a diagram here. And anybody that's been to paramedic school, you might've seen this in EMT school. Um, this is something that we work with all the time in medicine is this idea of how much air can our lung hold and how much does it move? And so you have your kind of standard tidal volume as you're just taking regular breaths, listening to me give the lecture, but you can actually move a lot more air than in and out of your lungs than you do in a standard breath. Um, this is your inspiratory reserve volume. This is how much you can take if you take the biggest, deepest breath possible. And then you have your expiratory reserve volume, which is that if you force out every single little bit of air you can. And it's important to remember that you also will have some dead space area like in your trachea and all your airways that can't totally close that air just kind of sits. So you never can get all of the air out. But what I, where I really like to point out here is, is that simply what we need to function in air and breathing and as far as air movement, it's a small amount of tidal volume, which is also why when you are bagging someone with your, your bag valve mask, whether they're intubated or they're a face mask, you just need to move this little bit of air. You don't need to do these huge giant volumes all over, um, which is really about, here it's showing seven, but we say six to eight milliliters per kilogram of body weight, ideal body weight. So what you should be. Um, but the big thing to take away from this last couple of minutes is this idea that ventilation is movement of air in and out of the lungs and respiration is the chemical reactions on the cellular level or your metabolism. Just a quick little thing here, kind of a little more advanced for our advanced providers, thinking about ventilation and oxygenation as we go forward. And then we'll kind of get into the diseases aspects. Um, understand that carbon dioxide levels is a function of your respiratory rate. And also that your respiratory rate is determined by carbon dioxide levels under a normal, healthy person. Oxygen is a function of PEEP, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, just kind of in a very basic concept, but basically the force that keeps your airways open and FiO2, which is the percentage of oxygen you breathe in. If you're at sea level, it's 21%. In Denver, 19 to 20%. 16% uh, if you go up to the top of Pikes Peak. 
Title volume is less important. And remember, don't make it excessive, meaning you don't have to squeeze that entire bag in as fast as you can. And the other thing is, is that remember that air not only needs to move in, but it also needs to move out. And so it needs time to do that. If you have an interest in this, you want to learn more about it. There's a great book called The Ventilator Book. It's kind of paramedic level and higher for overall reading. But if you have an interest in the science, um, go through it. It's a great read and kind of talks about this a little bit more on Amazon. Um, it's just a good reference. It's one that I use to base a lot of stuff on the lecture on. So we'll talk now about diseases. And please, if you guys have questions as we go through this, please feel free to interrupt, raise hands, send them in the chat. Dr. Wright's helping with all of that. Uh, this is your guys' lecture, your opportunity to learn. I don't mind being interrupted if you have questions. So real quick, are there any? Please shout them out. All right. So we're going to talk some about diseases. So we can kind of break down the idea of diseases of the respiratory system, pulmonary system, in a couple basic categories here. The first is air can't get in. All right. There's something causing the air to not get in, whether that is something stuck in the throat because the, a kid swallowed a hot dog, think field of dreams, um, or a choked on a hot dog, or that maybe somebody has fibrotic lung disease, interstitial lung disease, something that makes their lungs hard and leathery and they can't stretch out and open up anymore. Air cannot get out. So typically we think about this in, in lower respiratory disease, things like COPD and asthma, and we'll talk about this a little bit more. Gas exchange cannot occur. So for some reason that gas cannot move across the membranes that it's supposed to, where the alveoli or the little air sacs meet with the capillary beds. And so if for some reason that can't occur, you can't have gas exchange. So oxygen cannot move into the bloodstream, carbon dioxide cannot move out. Or perhaps blood can't get to the lungs for some reason. So you can move all of the air you want in and out of your lungs, but if blood can't get to the lungs to pick it up and offload this carbon dioxide, you might have a problem. There's also ways that mechanical failure can occur. You know, I talked about that the lungs rely on this vacuum system to kind of power themselves. If you have a mechanical fa failure of your vacuum, the lungs can't expand, air can't move in, re the re uh, respiratory process can't occur. Or the ventilatory process, excuse me, the ventilatory process cannot occur. And then you can also have a control system failure. This is primarily going to be in the brain. So to kind of break it down, we'll start a little bit here with asthma. So asthma is a, a chronic disease that tends to come in bursts, spurts called exacerbations. And so the best way to look at this is the difference between a normal healthy lung and a lung that's undergoing an asthma attack. So in a normal healthy lung, we have the alveoli, our air sacs, we have all of our capillaries that come along for the gas exchange. And this is in one of our small terminal airways here. And you'll notice it has this red band. So those are muscles. And those muscles help open and close airways as needed because as we showed in the diagram before with all the little waves on it, we don't always need all of the areas of our lung to operate. Um, and so they can open and close to make the body more efficient. In this, when you have asthma, there's an inflammatory process that's triggered by something, um, sometimes a virus, sometimes smoke exposure, pollen exposure, some type of irritant uh, often, and those bands will actually constrict. So the lung will get inflamed, you might get some mucus in it, and then the, the inflammation in those airways, it's kind of like, well, this area doesn't work, let's shut it off. And so you get this constriction of all of those airways by the tightening of these smooth muscles. And that's really what's happening here in asthma is the idea that you have this bronchial constriction, we'll call it, with this inflammation. And the amount of air that you can move through this tunnel versus through this tunnel is, is pretty significant. And so you're not getting air in. And what ends up happening is that air actually can move in a little bit, but it actually can't move out is the bigger issue. And so you get what's called air trapping. And that's why this is considered an obstructive process is because you're blocking the flow of the air back out. So how do we fix that? How do we how do we treat that? Well, we're always going to start with our ABCs, and you're going to notice this as a common theme. It's very convenient because respiratory is airway and breathing, um, but opening the airway and helping with breathing. So do your basic ABC assessment. Oxygen is always key. Um, if somebody is having trouble breathing, if they're in respiratory distress, 
oxygen is great. And we'll talk about oxygen a little bit more in the future, but you put them on oxygen as much as you can give them. And then you want to open those lower airways. So, you know, our ABCs is really about opening those upper airways, making sure they're upright or in a position that chin lift their jaw thrust, whatever they need to open the airway. But here we're dealing with the idea that you need to open the airways, the lower airways. And we do that in a couple different ways. We use things like inhalers with medications that we'll talk about here in a few to really open up that kind of inflamed airway. And we can even kind of go to the extreme here and give something like epinephrine, adrenaline, which actually helps open the airways in the same way that our body would if we get that adrenaline surge because a bear is chasing us. It, you know, our body's going to do everything we can to get as much oxygen in so we can run away to, you know, live. And so we can actually use things like adrenaline injected um, for somebody that's having a severe asthma exacerbation to help open those airways. So we do this kind of bronchodilators that are inhaled that's designed to be kind of localized to the lungs, or we can even send that to the entire body. And then we can do other advanced interventions, which we'll talk about, such as we can give steroids to reduce that inflammation, magnesium, which helps relax all those smooth muscles. And we can do non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, which is going to be CPAP or BiPAP to kind of all help out. And it's all going to be dependent on our level. And when we look at this kind of continuum here of care, it kind of starts with, for all of us that are in some form of first responder, um, we're always going to start with ABCs, no matter what our level of training is. Oxygen, as we move up, especially into our BLS providers and opening the airways, you know, as we look at advanced EMT scope, EMT intermediates, the idea of using inhalers, um, whether albuterol or ipratropium, and we'll talk about those in a minute. Um, and even in some places being allowed to use an EpiPen or another Epi injection. And then when we get into our advanced EMT intermediates and paramedics, really looking at these advanced interventions that we can do. And we'll talk a little bit about those and how effective those are. But the key that I really want you to focus on is this idea of getting them oxygen and opening their airways. So we talk about inhalers. One of the big ones is beta agonists. Um, and beta has to do with kind of the response to um, the stimuli. And so your beta agonists, um, you have beta one and beta two. Beta one, you have one heart, it speeds up your heart rate. Beta two, you have two lungs, it opens up your airways. Albuterol is our usual drug for this in the pre-hospital setting and, and even what patients use in primary care, um, their home inhalers, it's going to be albuterol for the most part. It directly stimulates your smooth muscle um, and causes it to relax. And you can actually see this here, and I love this diagram. Don't be uh, made afraid of it. Don't let it intimidate you. It's just the idea that we give something here that stimulates a process causing those muscles to relax. And that's all you need to know is that it opens the airways. It works in less than five minutes. That's pretty good time. It can last three to six hours. You can give it in a nebulizer um, where you put a liquid in and you can see the nebulizer here and then they breathe it in and there's that cool little smoke look. Um, but it can cause their heart rate to speed up. Not a big deal. We know it's going to do that. And really, unless they're allergic to the medication for some reason, there's no relative contraindications to this. You can give it to just about anyone. Um, so it's something that you can use if you believe they're having an asthma attack. Um, one of the things that we often do and that we teach is that, you know, if you don't have uh, inhalers and albuterol as part of your scope of practice, a lot of places and, and levels of care have the ability to assist somebody with their inhaler. So the CDC has made a nice little video and we'll just play this real quick. Using a meter dose inhaler, take off the inhaler cap and make sure the mouthpiece and spray hole are clean. Shake the inhaler 10 to 15 times. Without the inhaler, take a breath and breathe out all the way. Hold the inhaler upright. Put the inhaler in your mouth above your tongue and between your teeth. Seal your lips around the inhaler. Begin to breathe in slowly. Press down on the inhaler one time and keep breathing in. Hold your breath for five to 10 seconds. 
Open your mouth and breathe out slowly. Perfect. All right, so it's fairly simple. Most people know how to use them, but it's the idea that we want to help them if they're in this crisis state and they may be having a little trouble that we should be familiar with being able to assist them with it. All right, and we talked a little bit about epinephrine. Um, it's a pathomimetic, something that is that sympathetic nervous system, which is our fight or flight, that adrenaline rush kind of response. Um, it stimulates alpha, which has to do with vasoconstriction, making those blood vessels tighter, but beta, the elevated heart rate, the bronchodilation, and it's for patients that are not improving or really, you know, they're dying in front of you is really what we want to think. Um, there's always a concern. It can increase your myocardial oxygen demand. Um, but again, so does asthma. So does not getting air in. So it's not something we really worry about in a really severe asthmatic. Um, there are a couple of studies for those that are, are into the literature out there that basically say that um, it kind of helps, but we really don't have good data. We know that this is kind of that they're dying in front of you. Hail Mary. Let's make sure that we can do everything we can to help them out. So it's something just to consider, especially for our advanced providers. Um, again, check your protocols. Um, there are some BLS protocols out there that allow you to use an auto injector um, in this situation. Another medication I mentioned, just so everyone's aware, this is a paramedic level, some uh, EMT uh, intermediate levels, uh, magnesium. It's a smooth muscle relaxant that helps dilate those airways um, for severe refractory asthma. So basically patients that aren't getting better. Um, giving it too fast can cause their blood pressure to drop. But just so everybody kind of is aware where it really makes a difference is that it actually keeps patients from getting admitted to the hospital so if they were so sick that they're going to get admitted to the ICU, um, they're probably still going to go to the ICU. It's not going to make a difference. But for those patients that are kind of borderline, are they going to get admitted versus are they going to get some breathing treatments and get to go home? Um, it makes a big difference. And especially for those of you that are farther away from your hospitals, this is something that's going to have a, a big impact to give it to them early on and kind of kick in during that transport. Um, obviously, our priority being the albuterol and oxygen early on. But if you give this to them, there's a chance that, you know, you're going to have a difference um, when they get to the ER or a short time after they get to the ER, then maybe they're going to get ahead of the game and not have to get admitted. And so it's just kind of one of those opportunities that you have, especially if you have a longer transport time. Um, but one of the things we always want to figure out with our patients is really how bad is their asthma and so there are a couple of little hints. And I think for everyone, you know, when you meet that asthmatic or you're talking to them, you're talking to their family and you're trying to figure out what exactly, you know, how severe this is, how vigilant you have to be and kind of and set the expectations for yourself of their course. Um, there are a couple of different things. The so first of all, what are their baseline medications? Do they only use a rescue inhaler when they need to? When I go to the gym, occasionally I get short of breath and I use my inhaler. Or if I get a cold occasionally, my asthma will flare up, but I don't have to use it every day. Are they on a daily inhaled steroid, something like Advair, Spiriva, Qbar, something that they have to take an inhaler every day, whether they feel sick or not? That's somebody with a more severe asthma. That's what we would go from what we would go call mild intermittent, where you only need a rescue inhaler. You don't need to memorize these terms, but for us, that's mild. And then moderate is somebody that has to use a daily inhaler. So if somebody uses an inhaler every day, um, that gives you a little bit of a heads up that, hey, they have a little more severe asthma and also gives you the opportunity to ask the question, are you using it? Because sometimes those asthma attacks are because they're not using it. Maybe they're out of their medication. They can't afford their medication. Maybe they're visiting a parent that isn't their primary parent and they left it at home or they're on vacation. Like just one of those little clues that can kind of key in and just to why it's going on. Or the real severe, are you on daily steroids? Do you have to take medications every day because it's so bad? Um, these are very rare, but it just gives you a little more hint. If somebody takes steroids because of their asthma, they have really bad asthma. Um, and then other things that they might take, hey, I take Zyrtec, I take Claritin on a daily basis during pollen season because it irritates my asthma. And I take it for that. And that kind of just gives you the idea like, well, okay, they, they have a lot of triggers. They can kind of fire it up. They're doing some things to suppress it, but it might give you an idea of what really triggers their asthma uh, less than the severity of the asthma. How often do you have issues with your asthma? When was the last time that you had your asthma flare up or an exacerbation? And then 
Have you had ever had to be hospitalized because of it? Have you ever had to have um, the mask put on you? I always ask patients the Darth Vader mask, uh, if you've had that put on you. Uh, have you ever had to be intubated? Have you ever had to have a breathing uh, tube put in? Those are all keys that like, if they have any of those things, they probably have more severe asthma and you probably need to be a little more vigilant and aggressive in your treatment some. Uh, now we'll go over to asthma's older cousin here, which is COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So COPD traditionally has two flavors. Uh, those flavors are emphysema, which is kind of the classic we always think about, also known as the pink puffers, and we'll talk about that in a sec. And then the uh, uh, chronic bronchitis or the blue bloaters. Um they both are usually caused by the same thing, which typically be, tends to be long-term irritant exposure to the lungs, most typically smoking. Um, there are other things that cause this to happen. If you look at any of us that live in a city and you looked at our lungs, we're going to have small changes consistent with emphysema, obviously not to the level of a smoker, just from natural air pollution. Um, with all of this, in your emphysema patients, what you end up having is you kind of have this loss of elasticity and stretch. You kind of get this old worn out wilted balloon of airways. And so it causes them to be flimsy and collapse, especially when you can compare it to this nice, healthy, plump kind of uh, cluster of grapes uh, airways here. And so they become kind of, become kind of um, floppy. The reason that we have what we call the pink puffers is because those patients actually have to use kind of extra force to squeeze that air out. They've lost the elasticity of those lungs. And so those floppy sacs, they actually have to create a little more pressure to push the air out. And I mentioned PEEP, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in treatment later on, but they actually do something to resist the airflow out by kind of pursing their lips when they breathe out like, and the reason is, is that they're trying to actually build up the pressure to keep these airways from collapsing as they force the air out. Um, and so they kind of get this little puff face. With the chronic bronchitis, they tend to be um, have this kind of secretion buildup. So it's inflammation and chronic secretions of mucus in there that inflames and blocks the airways. And they tend to have kind of uh, a higher incidence of being hypoxic, a little more cyanotic, and tend to be heavier in weight. This, with emphysema, takes a lot of energy. So they tend to be thin, barrel-chested. It's not always the case but that's kind of the, the typical textbook patient. Whereas these patients uh, tend to be kind of more overweight, hence the bloaters part of blue bloaters. Again, it's one of these things, you're gonna manage it the same way, but it's just kind of be aware as you think about why this occurs. Um, one of the medications that we'll just kind of, as I kind of break up the medications to think about, uh, we mentioned in the asthma side is uh, anticholinergics. And so one of the classics is uh, ipratropium bromide, also known as atrovented in its brand name. And what it does is it actually blocks the signals that cause bronchial constriction. And so when we think about kind of the albuterol that we had earlier with the beta agonist um, comes in and directly goes and relaxes. Well, when you bring in the ipratropium, you come into this side here which actually goes in and what it does is it blocks the signals that causes the muscles to contract. So the reason that you may have heard something called a duo nev, or if you've ever administered a breathing treatment, assisted someone with a breathing treatment, or just gone through somebody's home meds, um, what they end up doing is they mix the albuterol and the ipratropium together to create this duo nev. And what that does is it kind of gives you the one, two punch of both relaxing the airways and blocking what is causing them to constrict and tighten up. Um, it's related to atropine. So anybody that has ever worked a cardiac arrest or potentially had their eyes dilated, um, atropine is a medication that kind of suppresses the parasympathetic nervous system or the feed and breed uh, part of our nervous system and goes on. It lasts for about five to seven hours. Um, Never would really have to worry about this in a pre-hospital setting, but it can actually cause you to bronchospasm, meaning those airways to tighten, which is ironic because that's what we're trying to fight. Um, and so you should think about that if long-term treatments, you're doing an inner facility somewhere, um, or you know, it's somebody that you know you have a long on scene time, maybe you're hiking them out of the backcountry somewhere. Those are all things to kind of think about 
Um, but for the most part, this should not be an issue for you. Uh, does anybody here, please shout it out. This is the interactive part. Know what plant this represents. Somebody throw it out there. All right, so not a botany group tonight. Um, this is uh, Deadly Nightshade or Atropina belladona, which is where kind of Atropina was originally derived from. So Deadly Nightshade is basically Atropina. Uh, we also mentioned earlier glucocorticoids, uh, which are steroids. The most common ones that you'll see in the pre-hospital setting are methylprednisolone or solumedrol, and then prednisone. And this is to suppress that immune response. They take about an hour to start, um, which especially for those of you that are further away from the hospital, longer transports, you might start to see um, the effect, but really you're looking at something that's going to take hours. We're trying to, you know, prevent the next asthma attack or the recurrent attack with them or the recurrence of the COPD flare up from all the inflammation that's caused with those chronic lung diseases. It actually does increase your beta receptors. So those same things that that albuterol binds onto and increases the number of them. So then you can actually have a bigger effect. When we give somebody a medication, we're saturating their receptors potentially. Um, so if you create more receptors, then you can actually put more on there. Um, it should be given when indicated, but it should never be your priority in your medications. Again, very similar to magnesium and very similar to magnesium. When we look at the data behind it, um, it's one of those things that helps you keep from getting admitted to the hospital but it's not gonna keep you out of the ICU. If you're really sick, it's not gonna make a huge immediate difference. You're still gonna be admitted to the hospital. But if you're that one that might be able to go home, it's gonna actually help you go home afterwards. Um, I always like to show this up here, uh, caponography. This is a lecture for a different time, a different day. Um, but we're seeing EMTs use caponography primarily for uh, monitoring breathing, especially after uh, Narcan wake up in an opiate overdose. But um, for those advanced providers out there, just a little plug to kind of do a little more reading on it. The idea that you can actually look at your waveform and understand the obstruction that is going on in the respiratory process. Um, that as you breathe, and this is your carbon dioxide breathing out, so this is your exhalation, this is your inhalation. As asthma and COPD and other bronchospasms uh, increase, um, you can actually see that based on how people are exhaling and then if it looks like jaws, get out of the water. Uh, kind of switching gears a little bit here to talk about some other disease processes. Um, pulmonary edema. So what is pulmonary edema? Pulmonary edema is going to be the buildup of fluid within the lungs, within the air sacs. And this usually happens for a couple of different reasons. The main reason that we tend to see and that you'll probably see the most in your pre-hospital care is patients with heart failure that flares up. So basically in heart failure, the heart can't pump blood out of itself through the left ventricle. The most common place for the heart to fail is the left side. Remember that's what takes and moves the blood from the lungs to the rest of the body out through the aorta and being distributed. And so what happens is if that left side of the heart is failing, whether it just stops working because you're having a heart attack, or if you are in a situation where the heart is weak, due to congestive heart failure, and it can't overcome the blood pressure to squeeze out, it's like kinking the garden hose. So your aorta is your garden hose, and it causes all that fluid to back up somewhere. And where it happens to back up here is the one place that it can escape, and that's going to be within the air sacs. And so you get the fluid in there from pulmonary edema. There are other things that can cause pulmonary edema. Um, there's been some reported instances where people will get Narcan from their opiate overdose, and all of a sudden they take a big breath in against the closed glottis, meaning that little flap that helps cover your airway when you swallow so that you don't choke. Uh, when it does that, it actually creates a vacuum within the lungs. And then that causes a pressure gradient, which causes the fluid to move into the lungs. So it can happen just so you're aware. Other things, if people are really sick with things like sepsis. We saw this in COVID where they would get ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome or any other irritant to the lungs, they inhale some toxic fume. Um, you can also get that fluid building up because you have breakdown of the barriers that keeps the fluid out of the alveoli. Um, the lungs or the alveoli and the capillaries do a really good job of kind of separating out the air and the, the fluid from the blood, but um, still allowing air to move across it. 
uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide to move across. If that is disrupted for some reason, you can actually build up fluid in the lungs. So one of the ways that that's treated, and this is going to be primarily in your intermediate and advanced providers, um, is the idea that we give people nitroglycerin. We give them nitroglycerin because what it does is it dilates the blood vessels, primarily the blood vessels in the guts, and makes the tank bigger. So instead of having all that pressure build up in the aorta um, and push into the lungs, uh, what it actually does is it creates more space for it to go to. And so we use nitroglycerin for that. It's short acting. Um, it starts in one to three minutes. It lasts 20 to 30 minutes. So you often will have to re-administer. We typically administer it every five minutes. It's really hard to give people if they're wearing CPAP, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, when you're trying to spray something under their tongue or put a tablet under their tongue and they don't have, a, um, you can't get to their tongue, you really can't give it to them. So in some places we use paste for that, where you'll actually put a paste on their chest. Um, caution with PDE5 inhibitors. Uh, in other words, Viagra. So Viagra, Cialis, Levit or, um, uh, Levitra, I believe it is. All of those things that are used for both erectile dysfunction as well as for some patients uh, who have pulmonary hypertension, which is basically high pressure on the right side of the heart, what brings blood from the body back and moves it into the lungs so that the gas exchange can occur. Um, they can be on these. And so if you give this if you give nitro to these patients, they can actually have um, irreversible vasodilation. Their blood vessels all open up and their blood pressure really drops. So it's always important to ask your patients, have you taken Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, uh, Tadenafil, any of those other things out there? Um, and remember, it's also important to ask women these questions because women are more commonly have pulmonary hypertension and so may be on these uh, for that. We're not going to worry about heart attacks right now. Uh, there is a question if it's safe in right-sided heart attacks. That's a classic thing for our advanced uh, our providers, our paramedics. Actually, it doesn't actually cause harm. They found when they actually studied it. Different lecture for a different day. Um, so I've mentioned a few times kind of CPAP or non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Um, and so we'll talk about that really quick. Um, first of all, what is it? It's a positive pressure force. So it's a device that is going to make a seal around the face, uh, over the nose and mouth. There are a lot of people that wear it for their sleep apnea. They tend to just have it in their nose. Uh, for us in the pre-hospital setting and in the hospital, we tend to have it where it goes over the face as a whole, where it goes over the nose, the mouth. Um, and it puts a little pressure. And that pressure is designed really to create a force for you to breathe against. Remember I talked about the emphysema patients, the pink puffers, that they are doing this thing with this pursed lips to try and build up the pressure and like resist their ability to breathe out. Well, the idea of what that's doing is that's creating a force for them to breathe against. Well, we're doing the same thing here with a mask. We put it on, we give them a little bit of positive pressure that keeps the um, airways open and allows them to breathe out, for, especially for those emphysema patients where they have those floppy airways. Um, and so... This was taken from some Denver Metro protocols um, that I'm a little more familiar with. Uh, you see it pretty common across EMS as a whole, what the indications are, and that is the presence of rails, which are crackles, ronchi, or wheezes, with somebody who is short of breath or hypoxic. And so like, think about patients that have an oxygen level, um, their SpO2 is less than 90, even when you give them oxygen. Um, they are short of breath with the inability to speak full sentences. Obviously not me right now. They're using accessory muscles. They might have uh, be using their abdominal muscles. You're seeing intercostal retractions. You're seeing their neck muscles all helping them breathe. Um, they have a respiratory rate greater than 24 despite getting oxygen. Um, or they have a reduced tidal volume. They're just not moving air. If they have two of those, these are somebody, these are patients that this may help. Um, and we've actually seen that it makes a difference, um, that they have better outcomes uh, in the long run, their hospitalization, survivability, they don't die um, when we use this in the pre-hospital setting. And we're seeing where they're actually using it for some um, BLS agencies are using it uh, in the field, not necessarily your agencies, but there are some out there um, where this is an EMT level skill. So there are contraindications because of risks. First of all, if somebody is not breathing or they don't have a pulse, it's not gonna do them a lot of good. 
Um, if they have low blood pressure, this actually increases the pressure in their chest, which compresses the blood vessels in their chest and decreases uh, blood flowing back to their heart and therefore drops their blood pressure. Um, so if they have low blood pressure, you can't use it. If they can't protect their airway, um, you can't use it because basically if they vomit and they have the mask on, they'll aspirate. They'll sw the vomit will go into their lungs. Um, or they can't follow instructions um, or signal that they're in trouble. That might be something um, because again, they can't tell you they're about to vomit that mask is on. If they're actively vomiting, obviously we don't want to seal it in. Um, or if they have a GI bleed, if you think they have a pneumothorax, we don't want to put them on positive pressure because that's just going to force more air into that pleural space, make that pneumothorax worse. If they have facial trauma, we can't do it. Or for some reason, their size or their anatomy does not allow you to get a good seal. It's not going to work. Um, just something to think about for the paramedics um, out there. When we talk about all these things, uh, especially our altered level or our you know, how altered are they? Obviously, if somebody's completely unresponsive, it's not a good thing to seal a mask around their face. Um, but if you feel that they can, you can reasonably remove it um, and you're having somebody watch them the entire time, that if they go to vomit, you can immediately rip that mask off and you think that the benefit's going to outweigh the risk, it's probably a patient you can use it on. When I put somebody on BiPAP or CPAP in the emergency department, there's a good chance that they are going to be in the room by themselves with that mask on. And so I have to assure that they have the ability to take it off when you're in the back of an ambulance. Um, and it's maybe, you know, two providers in there because you brought a rider with you. Um, or it's just you and you're right there with them the whole time and you're monitoring every single thing. They're at a higher level of observation than I'm giving them in the emergency department. And so maybe you have a little bit more wiggle room that you can leave it on a little bit, um, for that patient that, can indicate, but is maybe still a little bit altered. And ultimately this is your provider judgment. Um, if you think it's gonna benefit them and you feel that the benefit is gonna outweigh that risk, especially cause you're there to mitigate the risk. So just something to think about as you make this decision, obviously the utmost importance is patient safety and good outcomes. And if there's a risk of a bad outcome by doing this, we don't wanna do it. We always wanna make sure that our benefit greatly exceeds our risks. And uh, Dr. Durson, I'll just add on that part. I think that what I've seen really successfully done in the pre-hospital space is if the patient's not tolerating it, just if you have the hands, if you have the resources, quite, or if you can bring a fire rider, you know, you're the one making the clinical decision to put this on, but anyone can hold that mask on the patient. So the ability to have the mask strapped on and be able to do other things is important. But if you have someone that can hop in and just hold it up against their face to get them whatever positive pressure you can. Um, and then to be able to remove it quickly if they vomit or to give the patient a little break, um, it can be really useful to, to bring somebody along if you anticipate that you have a long transport and this is something, a tool you might need to use. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. I appreciate that. Um, just kind of thinking about it here, um, because we talked about it both in pulmonary edema and then kind of our COPD asthma, and those are very different disease process. And just make sure you understand what the purpose of this is. In your asthma emphysema patients, um, you kind of see this balloon here. This is your floppy airway when this falls down. And so this right here, this pump is actually your CPAP or your BiPAP pushing in, helping keep that airway open. Because if you kink off this balloon, it's not gonna be able to let the air out. I mean, that's what we're doing when we're filling up balloons. We're pinching it off, we're folding it, trying to keep the air in there. Well, that's what's happening in asthma or COPD. So that air can't escape. It's a very different picture with pulmonary edema, which is the idea is, is that we have this pressure gradient that normally keeps the blood in the bloodstream and the air in the airways and what's happened is, is that pressure gradient has shifted and that, that fluid is now pushing it, the air out and taking over its space. So the idea is, is that we use some pressure, we add additional air pressure to fight back that force. So we talked about nitroglycerin, we give it a place to go, and then we take it and we push it away. And so I think this is kind of the best way to think about it is what are you trying to do? Are you trying to keep the airways open or are you trying to push stuff out of the airways? Um, so just kind of think about it. Um, also, this takes a lot less pressure to maintain those airways, keep them open in your COPD and asthma patients. So we tend to use lower settings. Your protocols should kind of dictate your settings, but think about three to five centimeters of water. Whereas here, 
we are trying to, we need a lot more force to push it out because we're basically pushing against your blood pressure. And so we think more so in the range of maybe 10 to 15, start at eight, work our way up 10, 15, up to even some place times 20 um, centimeters of water. But 10 to 15 tends to be a good sweet spot in my experience. All right. So next we're going to talk about pneumonia. And we have a nice little chest x-ray here. You can see the heart, see all the bones. You can see the airways. But you've got this schmutz is the best way to describe it here. And this here is actually a pneumonia. And one of the ways you can tell is because you can kind of see the edge of the heart. It's kind of erasing it out. But this opacity that the x-rays don't want to go through, that's a pneumonia. Make your life easier probably if you had an x-ray machine and could read it while you're out there. But um, you can't. So with pneumonia management, support your ABCs as always, oxygen if needed. Um, if patients are having a little trouble, I talked earlier that oxygenation is a function of heat, that little force to breathe out against, as well as uh, the percentage of oxygen. Well, most of your CPAPs in the field actually run off of oxygen. They deliver 100%. Um, so you could actually give somebody oxygen uh, with a non-invasive if you needed to, to help kind of open those airways up and allow that to move in. And that's going to help them. Uh, whenever you have a pneumonia patient, and we'll talk a little bit more about pneumonia, maybe in the cases, um, your patients that are hypotensive, they're tachycardic, they're febrile, you always want to consider uh, sepsis, that you're not just treating a, a respiratory or pulmonary disease, you're treating potentially a systemic illness, especially those that are hypotensive, have signs of shock. Um, and you're going to monitor them and you're going to transport them. And that's going to be the big thing is that they need definitive care. But it all starts with your ABCs, oxygenating them, um, making sure they're perfusing well as you bring them in. Next is pulmonary embolism. So one function that I did not talk about earlier with the lungs, it's kind of an incidental function of the lungs, uh, but also works really well by design is that the lungs are a great filter. And what lungs do is they actually help prevent strokes. So if you get a blood clot in your lung, or excuse me, in your leg, it will, can break off and move to your lung. And that's typically a pulmonary embolism. Well, it blocks the blood flow into the lungs. And we'll talk about that in a sec. Um, but one thing that it really does is those lungs, because it goes down to the capillary level, keep that blood clot from going to your brain. So you don't have a stroke. And it's probably a lot easier to manage and recover from a pulmonary embolism for the most part than it is from a stroke. Um, so what really happens in a pulmonary embolism? Well, I think the best way to think about it is that it's a clog in the pipeline. So I believe it was earlier this year or end of last year, there was a cargo container in the Suez Canal that got stuck. And so basically what you have here is this is the uh, your pulmonary arteries and all of um, kind of where it breaks down into the branches, the segmental and the sub-segmental arteries, arteries in your lungs that are designed to bring blood to your lungs to undergo gas exchange. And you have this cargo ship here loaded up with containers. Well, those containers that are on here are red blood cells. And the cargo that you need to carry is oxygen and carbon dioxide. So you need to offload your carbon dioxide and you need to onload oxygen to take out. But what happens is you get this clog in the pipeline, just like that ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal. And so what ends up happening is all of those other blood cells, cargo containers are stuck out here waiting to enter the blood flow because it can't move through the lungs. And so that's essentially what's happening with a pulmonary embolism is you can get all of the air you want all around, which will say the land is where you can load and offload your cargo, your oxygen, your carbon dioxide here, but it can't make it through the bloodstream from the body back through the lungs to do undergo its gas exchange. And so with all that, that's what a pulmonary embolism basically does for you. So when you're thinking about it and you're trying to diagnose this in the field, knowing that the way that we really diagnose it in the emergency department is with a CT scan. That's our gold standard. And we have some other tools like ultrasound that we can use to do that. Um, you can get a pretty good idea of what's going on. And, and Dr. Wright and I, we know for the most part when somebody's going to have a pulmonary embolism um, and or with, with pretty good certainty. And so we're going to look for those signs that may show us. 
So one is, is going to, they're obviously going to be short of breath. They're going to potentially have chest pain uh, as part of this, but there are going to be some other hints. They might have clinical signs of a DVT. So they might have that unilateral leg swelling. They've got a blood clot in the veins of their legs. Um, and so that's causing a, a kink in the hose, a congestion back up, their leg starts to swell. That blood clot can break off and go to the lungs. That's what the most common source of these are. What causes that? Well, if they recently had surgery, if they have a cancer, cancer can actually make your blood hypercoagulable. It tends to make it clot more. So it makes you higher risk. Pregnancy, uh, estrogen. So somebody that has elevated estrogen from pregnancy or perhaps are on birth control pills. Uh, those are things that can make you at higher risk. Or if they have a prior pulmonary embolism. I had one a while back that they had a known pulmonary embolism. They stopped taking their blood thinners, which is the mainstay of management here. So guess what? They got another pulmonary embolism, another blood clot in the leg. Um, so those are all hints that you can use. So you have that patient that's short of breath. Their heart rate's elevated. They have some chest pain. And maybe they have these risk factors. It's a pretty good clue that they might have a pulmonary embolism. So what are you going to do? Well, again, you're going to assess and support their ABCs. You're going to give them oxygen. Um, you're going to treat their hypotension. So this can create a state of shock. We call it obstructive shock. You're basically blocking the pipeline. It's not just blocking that oxygen carrying capacity. It's blocking the actual blood movement. And so it can all back up. And so if they're hypotensive um, or signs of shock, we would consider that to be a massive PE, meaning they have a blood pressure less than 90 systolic. And so you can treat that with fluids. And for our, uh, for those of you that have advanced EMT, can do IVs, that's an option for you, just as you would any other hypotensive patient. But for our advanced providers, our paramedics and our uh, EMT intermediates, the potential to give things like epinephrine, norepinephrine, vasopressors that will help kind of you know, increase their pressure to perfuse the body. And this is the patient that you're going to want to rapidly transport if you have concern for an acute pulmonary embolism, making them shorter breath. We'll talk a little bit here about aspiration. I mentioned this earlier with CPAP. Uh, this is inhaling a foreign object in your airway. Um, and it really comes in to the idea that we want to prevent that. And this is one of the biggest things that we can do as EMS providers, the vomiting, altered patient, putting them on their uh, left side, you know, suctioning their airway, keeping them positioned well, um, you know, suctioning them out if they start to vomit and then supporting them, giving them oxygen if we need to. The CPAPer, if you're putting the mask on them, making sure they don't take it in. For you, it's going to be the same way that you would treat any other respiratory emergencies with supportive care oxygen. Uh, asphyxiation. Uh, this is a separate process. Aspiration, you tend to swallow something in the lungs. You block that ability to do gas exchange or to do ventilation. Asphyxiation is very different. It is the process of being deprived of oxygen from an external source. So that can be suffocation, but can also be that maybe somebody entered a silo and there was silo gas and that keeps them from uh, being able to breathe because it basically disrupts their ability to diffuse and exchange gas. Uh, somebody in a chem lab, somebody in an agricultural setting that for some reason is suddenly short of breath and we don't know why. Um, you can always think of asphyxiation. Again, oxygen, supportive care, rapid transport to the hospital. Pneumothorax. Um, this is basically, this is that mechanical failure of the lungs where you have uh, a disruption of that vacuum that allows the lung to expand, whether it's a hole on the outside, a stab wound, um, a piece of rebar that goes through, a bullet wound, or like a COPD patient that has really bad lung tissue, lots of blebs, these like big sacks of airways that have been destroyed to become these little pockets uh, that really don't do you any good, but they can rupture. And so then in that situation, air can actually move into the space from the lungs. So that's something to think about. Um, so you get air between the parietal pleura, which is part of the chest wall, the kind of lining, inner lining of the chest wall, and the visceral pleura, which is the outer lining of the lungs. Uh, that violation, as I talked about, can be internal or external, the hole in the chest versus the hole in the lungs. A simple pneumothorax is where that pressure in the chest is at atmospheric pressure or less, because you're going to have the exact same pressure that goes into the lungs when they're fully inhaled. Um, so there's nothing really much to do for that, except monitor the patient, give them oxygen. 
A tension pneumothorax is a very different story. This is where that pressure becomes greater than the outside pressure and actually starts to displace everything. So it's greater than one atmosphere. Um, and the typical signs of that are decreased uh, or absent unilateral breath sounds, hypotension, because it's actually going to pinch off and kind of shift over their uh, mena cavas so they can't get blood return, and they'll be hypoxic or in respiratory distress. What do we do? ABCs, as always, put them on a non-rebreather, even if you think it's a simple pneumothorax for some reason. Um, and that has to do with actually there's a whole washout thing another time, another lecture uh, to be able to kind of help re-expand the lung. You want to seal the hole on the outside, a chest seal. There's manufactured ones where you can use an occlusive dressing taped on three sides. And avoid positive pressure in these patients because you're going to take that that positive pressure greater than one atmosphere, and you're going to force it into that pleural space. So you want to avoid that. And for our advanced providers, this is where needle decompression comes in to uh, relieve that tension pneumothorax. Um, so just always kind of remember that for your advanced providers. Real quick, we are getting into respiratory season here in the next couple months. Things like uh, cold, flu, all of that. So I think it's always important to just think about our pediatric patients. And we'll kind of very quickly go through these so that we can get to the cases. Um, laryngeotracheitis, which is also croup. This is inflammation of the uh, upper airways, the larynx, and the subglottic airways. It's usually a virus causes it ages six to six, six months to six years. Um, and the patients, it's a very classic cough. Once you hear it, you'll never forget it. But they sound like a seal barking. So we have our cute little seal here. And so they get this kind of hoarseness with it. Usually it's mild. They get the barking cough. We give them oxygen. You keep them calm, transport them in. If it's moderate to severe, uh, they get strider. And usually this is when they have strider at rest. So they're sitting there and you can hear them whistling as they breathe. Um, for our advanced providers, remember your racemic epinephrine. For our um, EMT basics, think about you can use humidified oxygen as well for them. But remember that mask may irritate them. So it may not be actually a benefit. It may actually make them worse, but it's something that you can think about. Um, the classic finding that we have on x-rays, and I'll tell you, we usually never get x-rays on these, but you'll get what's called a steeple sign. It kind of looks like a church steeple here uh, where the airway is actually closing up. It's inflamed. The next in our menu of pediatric respiratory diseases is bronchiolitis. Usually virus, we think about this with our RSV patients, which makes up about 30%. So I have a nice little picture of an RSV virus, um, but birth up to about two years. So this is going to be your patient that you kind of sounds like a, an asthma patient. They're wheezing, they're in respiratory distress. Maybe they have some retractions. Um, if they're less than two years old, it's most likely bronchiolitis and not asthma. Um, however, if they have multiple episodes, uh, they're over a year old, multiple episodes within a year. They have a family history of asthma. It's something that we could think about that it might be asthma. And we could consider albuterol, especially with some of the longer transports that you have. Risks include being premature, uh, just young in general. If they have some type of neuromuscular disease, like a muscular dystrophy, they have a congenital heart defect, uh, some type of chronic lung disease already. Um, or they're immunodeficient. They're a kid that has a natural immunodeficiency, genetic immunodeficiency, um, or chronically on something like steroids that suppress their immune system. Uh, with all of that, the big treatment for these are suctioning and supportive care overall. And that's what we're going to do to help them out. You can do the little saline drops. And if you have the mushroom suckers, kind of suck some of those secretions out, and that will tend to help them out. And then we always think about asthma, reactive airway. Um, and we've already covered this, but really this is going to be your wheezes and your patients that are greater than two years old. As we talked about with, uh, the bronchitis, you think about, uh, those patients that have multiple episodes, maybe they use albuterol in the past. They have a family history of asthma. Mom and dad are taking puffs of their inhalers at the same time. Um, and with those, you know, think about your albuterol. If you can, they might have their own inhaler. You can assist with their administration. And for the severe, think about your epi, your steroids. Uh, and potentially giving them fluids. And that's because of that air trapping. Uh, the same way that CPAP can lower your blood pressure, it can actually do that. So you can actually think about fluids for our advanced providers. Hey, my uh, Dr. Durson, there was a quick question. Yeah, um, absolutely. Can, can you touch really quick on like kind of what numbers to expect on the capnography 
for COPD, emphysema, obstructive lung disease? Like, are you expecting high cap nose? Are you expecting low cap nose? So you're going to typically expect low cap nose. And the reason that you're going to think about low cap nose is that this is an air trapping disease. And so they're actually not going to be able to fully exhale. Um, and this is one of the key things to always think about caponography is it's really good at waveform to like monitor breathing, but your numbers are not necessarily going to be a true of reflection of what is going on in the patient's bloodstream because that they are trapping carbon dioxide in because they can't exhale it out. So you may see low numbers. Their increased work of breathing is going to get rid of all of the carbon dioxide that they can possibly get out, but they're not getting out everything. So you may see a COPD patient who has a capno of 15 or even a normal capno. And that might be a, um, a little bit scary for somebody that's working because it means that they're building up so much CO2 in their um, bloodstream and they just can't get it out. So it's really good to be able to kind of, if you understand the waves, to understand what's going on in the lungs, but that number could be falsely reassuring if it looks normal. So just kind of be aware of that. You would expect in your patients that are having some movement though, to have a lower than usual number. I hope that answers your question. All right. Uh, so back to the pediatrics, just real quick, kind of think about your ages that kind of go into this. Croup is really all about that cough. Um, and remember that some of these things can cross over. You can have croupitis, uh, where you get a little bit of croup and bronchiolitis at the same time. Um, and then, you know, your younger patients are going to be bronchiolitis that they're going to really benefit from suctioning. Um, and your asthma patients, um, you're going to tend to be older. You can have a fever and asthma if they have a virus that's triggering, triggering it. Um, but for the most part, if it's just pure asthma, no fevers. So just something to think of. This is a great moment if you want to take a screenshot, just that little summary. I'll give you about 10 seconds to do that. Um, and then you can also have croup and asthma, which is known as crasma. Those are fun things that a pediatrician taught me, not in a medical textbook. All right, so we're gonna do a couple scenarios. Um, I would really like for you guys, if you can, to come off mute kind of just shout out answers as we go through. Um, it'll make it a better learning experience for you and we'll go from there. So please be interactive in these. So case one is called a little squeak. You have a 16 year old female. She's complaining of shortness of breath. Uh, her um, HPI, so her past history here, she was running on a local track meet at the high school and became short of breath. No recent illness, fever, chest pain. Uh, really no fever because I put it twice. She's got a past medical history. You find out of asthma. She's never had surgery. Okay. She tells you how she has medications. She takes loratadine, which is Claritin and allergy medicine. She takes albuterol. Okay. What do you guys want to know? What's next? From the chat, Dr. Durson, has she used her inhaler? Um, she has not. We'll get to that. Anything else you want to know right off the bat? Any recent? Is she on breath? Oh, go ahead, Kevin. Sorry. Any recent spraying of chemicals on the football field or around where they're at? Great thought, but none that we know of. Anybody want From to run? the chat, is she on? Is she on birth control? Uh, no, not on birth control. All right, here's some vitals. Does anybody want to do a physical exam? I'll give you a, her relevant physical exam. She's to Kipnik. She has some increased work of breathing with some retractions. And she has expiratory wheezes in her upper fields. Is there any other questions that you have at this point? any intercostal retractions or accessory muscle use and or um, collapsing of the chest cavity to the back of the chest wall. Perfect. She, we're going to say that she has a little bit of uh, abdominal muscle use and she has some intercostal retractions. Um, right. From the chat, Dr. Durson, any history of vaping? 
Uh, no history of vaping. I like this because it gets me the questions that I did not put in here. Uh, so with all of this, uh, give you a couple other pieces of information. Um, we said that she had an inhaler. She hasn't tried it. It's in her locker. Great place for it to be at Scrack Me. Um, what kind of questions did we, I ask earlier that you could kind of judge the severity of her asthma? Anybody have any questions related to that? Well, I'll throw you a bone here. She only usually uses her inhaler when she's working out or if her seasonal allergies flare up, which is why she has the Claritin. She's never been hospitalized and never had an intubation. And it is a little smoky from the local wildfires. So what's our diagnosis? She's having an acute asthma exacerbation. From the chat, maybe exercise induced, but uh, not thrilled with the vitals. Perfect. Yeah, in her vitals, you know, she's breathing a little fast. Her heart rate may be up because she was exercising. Um, and now she's short of breath. All right, so what do you want to do? You are, and to preface this, you are a BLS first responder, non-transport that shows up. So it's a, we'll say an EMT and a EMR on the ambulance. What do you want to do? Or on the rescue? I'm going to try and Help pull her it. with her inhaler from the chat. And I don't know if you want to pull up the chat if that's, if that's smooth there. There's a lot yeah, of I'm trying to pull conversation up, in the chat. Pull up the chat here so I can see it at the same time. Perfect. Uh, perfect. And maybe we can make that go a little faster. So yeah, assist with her inhaler. Perfect. Uh, maybe a little bit of oxygen. I love that. So we're going to give her some oxygen. We're going to put her in a position of comfort. We're going to assist her with her inhaler. If you have inhalers as part of your EMS protocols uh, for your BLS providers, maybe give her some of that. See, so call in for hypertropium. Perfect. If that's not, if that's part of your call-ins, I think it's a great idea. And you can go ahead and initiate transport on her. Um, if you have ALS providers there, what, what different would you want to do? What are the other things that you might want to throw in? Oh, maybe we'll do some more nebs. And we might consider some magnesium and some steroids for her. Doesn't sound like she's an extremist to the point that we would need to give her a dose of epi, but that's how we manage her asthma. Perfect. And so I do see the question about Epi. Yeah, I think that she's pretty stable overall. She's tolerated. See how she improves. Obviously, if she crumps, uh, that would be something you would consider Epi on. But in this scenario, if she gets better, you transport her. She's at the hospital for a few hours. A couple of breathing treatments goes. All right. This one's called I Can't Lay Down. And I do like calling the parents. Remember that, um, so somebody mentioned call the parents. Uh, if you need to treat this patient, you're doing it under implied consent because she's a minor um, and you're rendering emergency treatment, but it always is great to call the parents, inform them, um, you know, partner with them in the management of it. But ultimately, if you can't do that, that's a patient that uh, is implied consent and whatever you feel is best for the patient you can do. All right, so this is an 88 year old male. Uh, your complaint is shortness of breath, and their HBI is uh, one week of sh worsening shortness of breath, and they can no longer walk up one flight of stairs without stopping, and they can't lay flat to the point that they are started sleeping in the chair, uh, and they're coughing up pink stuff. And I already see somebody mentioning they can't lay down. They're thinking about pulmonary edema. All right, past medical history. Atrial fibrillation, congestive heart failure, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. Their medications. All right, what do you see on there that you think about? And this is what the great thing about respiratory patients is sometimes they might paint you a mixed picture. This is pretty clearly not supposed to be a mixed picture. 
but their medications are going to tell you what their underlying disease is. So what do we see on here that might indicate uh, somebody with CHF when you just look at these meds? Perfect. Furosemide. I love it. Um, you know, somebody that has atrial fibrillation, they're on diuretics. Those are your classic CHF patients. Got some vitals for you. And I'll give you a physical exam. So they're tachypnic, they're pale, they have some increased work of breathing, they have crackles bilaterally, and they have bilateral lower extremity swelling. Anything else that you want to know right now to help you make your decisions or help prove your diagnosis? Perfect. We have a comment oxygen for somebody that's drowning. Yep, they are. So we'll get that in that treatment. I love this. Has he taken his medications today? Well, when we look at what else we want to know, he ran out of them a week ago. Probably not a good thing. He's not having any chest pain. He has any recent surgeries or hospitalizations as we think about this. He doesn't require oxygen at his baseline. Just some things that we might want to know. I love diesel. Uh, my favorite is LSD, which is light siren is diesel. So what's your diagnosis? I think that the, the chat has already hit it. He's having a CHF exacerbation. So if you're that same great crew that showed up on our asthma patient with a, a first responder in an EMT and a squad or a rescue, non-transport, uh, or you're a BLS crew that you, know, you show up in an ambulance, EMT level staff, what do you want to do? CPAP and diesel, O2 and LSD. I like you guys. Oxygen, position of comfort. Consider CPAP if you have it. Request ALS or initiate your transport. If you're an ALS provider, what are you going to add in there? Remember, it's always BLS before ALS. Might do an EKG, make sure they're not having a STEMI that's driving this. Even though they're not having chest pain, it does happen. Maybe that positive pressure, if you didn't have it in your BLS scope, some nitroglycerin and transport them in. Perfect. We'll do another one or two, depending on time, and then we'll get to the end. All right, so here's another case for you here. 58-year-old female. You get called for chest pain and shortness of breath. The history had several hours of a sudden onset of shortness of breath with right-sided chest wall pain that's sharp and a new cough with just a tinge of blood to it. Very curious. They have a history of high blood pressure for which they take hydrochlorothiazide, which is a mild diuretic, our first line medication for high blood pressure. All right, got some vital signs for you. Ooh, that blood pressure is a little scary. A little tachycardic, they're breathing a little fast, a little hypoxic. They've got just a touch of elevated temperature. Not a full fever though, we would say 38 for a full fever. They're tachypnic, they're tachycardic, they're pale, they have increased work of breathing, but their lung sounds are Perfectly clear. Okay, we're already looking for a helicopter. Uh, is she on a daily dose of Viagra? She is not. Pedal edema. No. I'm sorry, wait. Unilateral swelling, yes. Not regular pedal edema. Because when you remove the blanket, you figure out that she had a knee replacement a week ago. And we're starting to see it here. We're thinking of pulmonary embolism. So that right lower extremity is swelling. Uh, she's been compliant with her normal medications. 
but there's this box of this injected medication at noxaparin that she was prescribed after surgery has not been taking because she doesn't want to give herself shots. Um, and so we have kind of this differential going on here, seeing uh, pulmonary embolism versus sepsis, thinking about it. I think with our unilateral swelling, what do we think the diagnosis is? Where we're going with the PE. But it's definitely a good thing with that temperature and that low blood pressure and the recent surgery. It is possible that they could have pneumonia. Um, but they're having an acute pulmonary embolism. We're going to consider it massive, given the fact that they have presence of shock. And the DVT is probably there and is what triggered this, um, this pulmonary embolism that happened. So what do you want to do? For our... Perfect. Transport now. I love it. For our first responders, our EMTs, ABCs, oxygen. You can give them IVs if you have uh, the ability to do IVs and give her a fluid bolus for that shock. Um, see a couple things on here. Nitroglycerin with her blood pressure. First of all, it's probably not going to help in the pulmonary, um, in the PE, the pulmonary embolism, because this isn't really an edema issue. We don't need to send it somewhere else. And if we have somebody that's hypotensive to begin with, remember our pressure was in the 80s systolic. It's going to really crash out their pressure. Uh, CPAP may not actually help this patient um, simply because it's not an issue of moving air. Remember, this is a clogged pipeline for the blood flow. So they're still moving air just fine, and they can get plenty of oxygen in and out. It's an issue that they are not getting enough uh, blood flow through. So what we want to do is apply supplemental oxygen so that we saturate every red blood cell going through, but we're not necessarily going to be able to um, get it out. And Dr. Wright, of course, tell her to take her anoxaparin. Well, she's going to need it. She's probably going to need a different dose now, though. She's not going to need the preventative dose she has. She's going to need the treatment dose. But request ALS rapid transport. Those that thought early about getting a helicopter, getting their ALS resources, great idea. For ALS providers, you're going to add on EKG. You might think about vasopressors for that low blood pressure to help make sure that she's perfusing. All right. Uh, where are we at? I think we can do one more, um, and I'm actually going to jump ahead in a case just because I really like this one, and I had this case a couple years ago. And so this is a really bad cough. So you have an 80-year-old male. He's calling you for shortness of breath and chest pain. He's had three days of increasing shortness of breath with a cough, minimal improvement with his nebulizers, and his cough has a new green sputum. And then he has a sudden onset of chest pain following a coughing spell. He's got a past history of COPD, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and he has sleep apnea. His meds, he's on oxygen, four liters at baseline. He uses Duoneb, Spiriva. He's on Lisinopril and hydrochlorothiazide for his blood pressure. He takes a daily baby aspirin. He's on a Torvastatin for his cholesterol. Here's his vital signs. He's hypotensive. He's tachycardic. He's tachytonic at 36. His oxygen saturation is 74%. And he's cranked up his oxygen concentrator as high as it goes to six liters. And he's afebrile. So we're seeing some pneumonia. Uh, somebody here is thinking, got potential for a pneumothorax from coughing due to infection or something. Temp. Um, does not have a temperature. I don't know if that was an ask or if there's something else. Um, but does not have a fever. And here is his physical exam. He's in acute distress. He's the Kipnik. He's got wheezes on his right side. He has no left-sided lung sounds. And his trachea is moving to the right. Anything else you want to know? I think we're getting it. Um... Uh, so he's end stage COPD and he has no multiple blebs. I love that somebody picked up that that was bad. Yes, 
tracheal deviation is a late sign intention pneumothorax. No recent trauma or surgery. Breathing was really difficult, so he put on his home CPAP, and all of a sudden it got worse. So our diagnosis, you guys have it. He's got a tension pneumothorax in the setting of his COPD exacerbation. And Kevin is already on it. Needle that chest. So for our EMTs, we're going to do our, our ABCs. We're going to put them on oxygen. No positive pressure for this patient. We're going to request ALS rapid transport. If you don't have any other option, put them in, load, and go. Our ALS providers... We're going to do needle decompression, nebulizers, glucocorticoids to help treat the, the COPD exacerbation at the same time, get the working part of the lung working again. So there is a potential for non-invasive positive pressure ventilation after decompression. We probably don't want to do that with a needle, but if you're dealing with a flight crew, um, if you're one of the places that can do chest tubes, this is typically outside of the state of Colorado. Um, or there are some places in Colorado that are doing finger thoracostomies. Um, that is something that you could consider, not that you necessarily want to do some of that to somebody that's awake, um, but you can decompress. And if they were still really bad, the idea that you could potentially put non-invasive positive pressure on them, but you do have a risk of making them worse, especially if that needle clogs up and you can't keep access. So probably would not want to do it, but that's something that you could potentially think about. Um, this is a patient that I actually had in the ER. The difference was is that they had CPAP put on them um, by uh, first responders and the ambulance, and that actually caused them to have the pneumothorax. And so when they came in, we put an ultrasound on them real quick, saw they had a pneumothorax, figured it was tension, put a needle in and did a quick percutaneous chest tube. He took a deep breath and felt much better. Um, so this does happen. The big thing is remember that multiple diseases can happen at the same time. So just be aware. With all of that, uh, we are at the end of our time, and I want to respect be respectful of your time. These are some re references I used. If you guys have questions about anything, please, this will be on a future slide. Write down my email. Reach out to me. I'm happy to set up a phone call, talk EMS, answer any questions anytime. Um, that is what I do. I love working with our field providers, our pre-hospital providers. Um, with all of that, this is your QR code. Take a screenshot of this if you need to, so you can scan it later, get your credit, get my email, put it down. Please reach out anytime. Um, again, I'm always happy to talk about these things. If there's anything you want clarification on, explanation, um, want to talk anything else, let me know. I'm happy to. Thank you very much, everybody, for your participation and joining us tonight. Hope that you learned something and hope that uh, this makes an impact on a patient's life in the future.